Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. We hear the expression, food is medicine. We also hear about the importance of the gut, the second brain, where 70% of our immune system resides, how important our relationship is with our microbiome. We also hear about climate change. It's a huge question, political question, economic, environmental. And of course, in the eastern half of Australia, we are going through what some are calling the worst drought in living memory. There's, of course, a connection between all of this, and it's very basic. We need healthy foods to be healthy. And we need healthy soil to grow that healthy food in, not just for today, but for the future as well. And when it comes to soil, it turns out that how we manage it, how well we understand it, is critically important. Farmers are in charge of all of that, often being advised by industry and regulatory bodies and academic institutions, which in turn are all influenced by industry, or a lot are. Sound familiar? Well, our healthcare could be said to be suffering from the same problems. My guest today is organic farmer Glenn Morris, whose organic beef farm is in the northern New South Wales area around Inverell. Like many farmers, Glenn studied agricultural science, ag science, and observed what the various practices were doing and noted that there was a vulnerability inherent in our land and how it was being managed. So he decided to go back and study more by doing a master's in sustainable agriculture and in particular the importance of the soil in building resilience, improving the land's ability to absorb and store water and improve the nutrient value of the land. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Glenn Morris. Welcome to the show, Glenn. Thank you. Glenn, you are a farmer in northern New South Wales, and I was wondering if you could just share with our listener, many of whom may not be out on the farm, uh, living in the city, and give us a bit of a backstory about where you are now and how you got there. Uh, Yeah, thanks for that. Basically, I'm uh, living on a farm in the northern tablelands of New South Wales. Um, We're just off the top of the range, sort of heading west, Um, so we're about 40 kilometres um, just just coming down the slopes, basically. So it's a nice little in-between climate, if you like, from the real cold of um, the mountains and, and not quite as hot as the, the plains. So um, quite a nice spot to live normally. Mm. And you've been there, is that where you grew up? Uh, no, I actually, um, Ron, I was born on a property down near Goulburn, but um, due to different circumstances, fires, what have you, um, I ended up growing up in the city and then, uh, yeah, basically decided when I got to about 20 that I wanted to get back to farming and I've made a career out of um, farming ever since. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of, but, I've just, just been working my way up. But your farm is not an ordinary farm. Well, I wish it was, but uh, tell us a little bit about what your farm, what distinguishes your farm now. Uh, yeah, look, it, 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 it's sort of interesting Um you know, basically, as I say, I just sort of made a career out of farming. I, I, I was trained conventionally, um, went to conventional ag college. And then it, all the time that I was sort of, you know, learning new techniques and that I had this sort of, I suppose, intuitive feeling that um, the landscape was starting to get unhealthy, that the amount of chemicals I was seeing being used um, couldn't be good for anything to do with growing food or looking after biology. So, so over the years, I, I've sort of been leaning towards, I guess, a biological and organic type of farming. And and uh, the thing that really set us apart um, was probably when I got the the full reins of a management job about twenty years ago, and I got the opportunity to start studying sustainable agriculture. So that made me aware of just how serious a lot of a lot of the ecological issues were in farming. Um, but the other thing that really um, changed the way we do things was I, I was watching our landscape sort of go from a, a devastating drought, like, exactly like we've got now, and then we'd get like torrential rain and, and, and that rain, instead of being absorbed by the soil and helping 
heal the land and grow beautiful food would would in a lot of cases it would actually do a lot of damage so we could see it again now but it, it would tear off the landscape and so we'd go from drought to flood to drought um, and with that as well as doing the study on climate change and sustainable farming I was I was seeing reports on how serious the issue of climate was um, and this was in 2000 so the reports I were reading were already 10 years old um, and that just hit home for me. I just thought, wow, you know, and I was seeing the climate extremes on the farm. So I was watching the water get away from the landscape. So we had a busted water cycle. We had extreme temperatures and climate change knocking on our door. And I, and I got quite sort of, you know, alarmed about it. And I thought, geez, you know, and, and one of the things that people have got to know about climate change, CO2 takes centuries to break down. So we've already got a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's going to take centuries to break down. So I just thought, how are we going to, what on earth can we do to sort of deal with these big issues of water cycling, of, of climate change? And the third one that I was starting to touch on back then was we were looking at organic farming and I was starting to learn just how depleted our food was in nutrition. So three big issues that I thought as a farmer um, that deeply affect me what on earth can I do about it? And luckily, uh, you know, I had a really good friend that understood about soils and I said, mate, this climate change thing, it's, it's bloody serious. And, I, and, and, you know, what are we going to do? And, and, I, and I was talking to him about the water cycling and, and he was actually a conventionally trained agronomist that had gone towards organics. And he said, Glenn, if we can build humus levels up in the soil, we can pull that carbon out of the atmosphere and also humus can hold an amazing amount of water. And I and I sort of looked at him and I'd seen a few little bits of literature on the subject and I thought, if you're right, this is, this is the biggest solution we have to actually getting the climate back in order and for actually getting the water cycle um, going again. So, so I went <laughs> back to university and, and I started to study a, a master's in sustainable agriculture at that stage, um, doing a special dissertation on, on humus. Um, basically called securing Australia's water supplies by by getting a better understanding of humus. So um, yeah, and 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 so the thing there and and that that set us apart as a farmer right then and there was I realised we weren't just farming for food. We were actually farming for a stable climate, farming for a water cycle, and we have to connect. Um, it's the thing that the message we need to get out of this drought. We have to connect that every hectare of land is absolutely critical for, for restoring the climate, for restoring the water cycle and for providing beautiful, nutritious food. So, yeah, that's, wow. that's a little bit about <laughs> why we're different. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot to discuss there, Glenn. I mean, that is that's that is huge, isn't it? Because, of course, uh, you know, people think um, there's a drought on and all we need is rain and problems solved, but you made the point that actually that could be the beginning of another problem and that is, what, we lose the soil as it gets washed away. And, and that is the problem in a nutshell because... The, the, the thing that, you know, after doing my master's and, and researching humus, the, the, the vital element that we need in our landscape, um, we need perennial vegetation and we need to build those levels of humus. So the first thing that we lose in a big flood rain event where there's a lot of erosion is actually that beautiful topsoil that contains the humus. So, you know, we, we've got to get out of this cycle of degrading the landscape and we've got to get into a cycle of actually starting to build it. So... And it's really, really hard on people at the moment because they just cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. But but you cannot start building humus when you're, you've already got a degraded landscape. You have to actually get yourself set. And we've done it twice. We've I've taken over two degraded properties now. I'm on my second 10-year project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and you've got to sort of say, what can I do when we start to get some moisture that's actually going to start to build up the landscape and, and get us get us through the next dry time. So, yeah. As yeah, I say, well, I, I, de I we definitely go. want to discuss discuss how you're going about that. But let's just go back to the very beginning here because conventional ag college is where a lot of farmers go. I mean, a lot of people who are out on the land want to learn as much as they can about being as efficient as they can. And so the logical place for that is to go, I guess, to an ag college, agricultural college. And and uh, these kind, what is taught there? What what's the kind of basic message that it gets taught 
in, in an agricultural college? How does it differ from I, what I, you're talking about? Yeah, look, I, Ron, I think, I think the problem is what we're getting, you know, what we were taught at Ag College is the same thing that, um, you know, being taught at universities that's being, you know, promoted by state governments, that's been promoted by our ag lobby groups. It, it's high input chemical farming. So, so if, if you want to grow a lot of food and, or a lot of plants or a lot of animals, um, you know, we're taught that you can actually do that synthetically. And in a way, the landscape is no more, is being treated at the moment, um, no more than like a hydroponic system where we just, you know, you know, and this was science that was seen as very successful. So no one's fault, but they just, you know, when the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium sort of um, mentality came out that you could grow plants by pouring on synthetic fertiliser, um, you know, the world embraced it. And unfortunately, we've, we're still embracing it, you know, at our ag colleges. So what was missed there was actually looking after your soil biology, understanding the nutrient, you know, building really sort of high integrity nutrients in your food for people to eat. So, so there were a lot of health issues as a result of that form of agriculture. So unfortunately, when I started to do my um, research into humus, a lot of soil scientists, you know, apologised to me because they said, you know, we've dropped the ball on organic matter and soil humus for 50 years because, you know, the funding streams, if you like, for, for, for government and for colleges and universities weren't coming from something that is created in a beautiful, natural way. So, you know, we've sort of got to look at, you know, that form of funding and try and get more independence in our organisation. So I learned that way as well. And, and you know, and, and, and you can pour it on and you can... And it looks like you're doing an amazing job. And, yeah, as I say, unfortunately, the, the resulting products and the, and the unseen costs um, that have happened to our environment are basically starting to surface now. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, you, now, you've mentioned this word humus, um, and, and, you know, to the city person, they may think you're talking about a Lebanese a spread that goes on to, you know, Peter Britt. <laughs> but but yeah, let's exactly. talk about that because it's so important, isn't it? I mean, uh, tell us what humus is and why it's so important. Yeah, look, um, it, 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 is, it, it is so much more than something you put on. <laughs> it's spelled bread. differently it's just... anyway, isn't it? But let's... Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go on. Yeah, but we could use that analogy, if you like. So, so say we had a beautiful planet covered in beautiful fresh water and forests and, <laughs> and, and we wanted to actually make it really, really healthy... Um, something we could do is get our actually soil humus and, and spread that over the earth. And as I've already sort of alluded to, we would um, actually correct some of the biggest challenges the planet's facing. But but I'll get back to explaining what it is. So, um, you know, the scientists really struggled with humus because they took a scientific approach and they tried to break it into the humic acids and the fulvic acids and the different compounds. And But no one ever got a handle on what it was as a, as a complete agent in the soil. And and, and a lot of people are, are trying now to um, catch up. And But it, what happens is, is the microbes, you know, in the soil, they, they, they get the organic matter that that's just comes from everyday leaf litter and cuttings and you name it, any type of organic matter, and they break it down. And, and then they start feeding on the sugars that the plants, a lot of people don't realise, but when a plant's growing, it's not all going into the top of the plant. It's or the roots, it's actually the plants are clever enough to realise if they want good health, they'll pump 30% of the sugars they make from photosynthesis into the soil root zone. So the microbes are taking those sugars, they're com breaking them down, changing them into beautiful, um, you know, healthy compounds for, for our health, and, and they're, they're building, combining them with the broken down organic matter. So, so it's this process of totally breaking everything down and changing the compounds and then what this miraculous process and i call it the holy grail because what happens is then the microbes reform it so so they'll take something like lignin which is the woody material in a plant they'll break its components apart and then and then they start rebuilding it and it's so this super molecular structure that that is reformed and it can last thousands of years and it and it's it's got about 56% carbon, so that's the real opportunity with solving climate change because 
if it can last thousands of years and we can actually, you know, encourage microbes to make it in the soil, um, there we have our carbon locked safely away again. So, you know, beautiful process. But so, so the, um, yeah, the official explanation is it's, it's really like a, a, <laughs> a flocule or a, or a polyglot collection of very large molecules um, from that broken down organic matter that I mentioned. Um, and then it it's, it's just becomes this super honeycomb structure in the soil um, that coats the entire, the entire soil matrix. So, yeah, you've, you've basically got this plasma-like gel, and, and it's actually called amethyst, Ron, so there's, there's no distinct shape of humus. It comes in a different shape every time. So one, someone sort of referred to it like a pack of cards. Pick two cards, you'll never, you know, like you'll get a different sort of hand every time. So, so the um, humus is even more complex. So it, it's called amethyst, which means no structure. And that, that I think, is really thrown scientists do. You know, you can't describe it. Um, so it's this humus, this plasma light gel that's got tiny little colloidal particles in it and organic complexes of plasma that coats the entire soil matrix, um, <laughs> that, that holds water, that stores carbon, that provides our nutrition, um, prevents us from getting sick, and, and, and we forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it interesting? I mean, yeah. you, you and I met recently at the Mind Forum back in, the first, in, in May, and I think we were both reflecting on this amazing relationship we have with microbes, you know, and I think to our listener they will be aware that we've become very focused on gut microbiome, but the soil microbiome has an equally, if not greater, story to tell, and humus is part of that story, isn't it? Absolutely, and I'm really glad you mentioned that because one of the um, presentations at the uh, Mind Forum that really um, caught my attention was um, presented by Dr Christabel Yo, and, and um, she was talking about the gene interactome in our in our body. So so in our 1.8 kilogram, you know, gut microbiome, if you like, um, our microbes, human, uh, sorry, our human genes were actually um, interacting with the microbial genes for all these, you know, important bodily processes. And she was she was talking a figure of 10 million unique genes in that interactome between the human genes and the and the microbe genes, and I and I did some quick figures because <laughs> yeah. I thought, what is going on in a hectare of soil? So, and I guess that's why I was at the conference making that link with with people like yourself, but also with the information back to farming. And so, you know, if a hectare of soil at thirty centimeters deep is weighs about four million kilograms, um, I worked out there'd be 10, 10, 000 quadrillion microbes <laughs> and their genes interacting with 500,000 different organic compounds in that humus. So what on earth have we pushed aside mm. <laughs> for a handful of chemical fertilisers? You know, I, I just it, it's just blowing my mind how, you know, important this is. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess going back to this chemical model, uh, it's so easy, as it is in healthcare, to forget that there's a microbiome there because if you put in the potassium, this, the, the nitrogen, the phosphate, you will get above the soil a plant that looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, that's, <laughs> and it's, you know, and it's that, a, bit like, that... a bit like medication, really, isn't it? You could manage a disease with medication and on the surface make things look reasonable, but do you want it to be healthy or not? I love this. This is what I love about this farming story, Glenn, is that it, the, the comparisons between what's going on out on the farm and what's going on in our body is, is so, so connected. Absolutely, you know, and it's just, you know, this this food quality thing, as I say, it was the sort of third thing as a, you know, budding organic farmer that, you know, we've been farming organically now for 18 years, but just just sort of starting to understand just just how vitally it, important it is to to make sure the soil is 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 fertile naturally and and getting the the precursors if you like for all that beautiful complex amino acid formation and 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 like i as i say i, I went to or as i said um went to conventional ag college i never learned we you know we're only just starting to understand a lot of these things but you know amino acids you know they're in the soil they can be absorbed directly by the plants and form a really true beautiful form of protein and the the same with the fat 
stats and and um, you know that's what we need for health and you know it, it's really interesting Ron because you know I came across an old paper years ago actually they were cassettes and I and I listened intently they were really bad recordings but by a, a beautiful soil scientist that was around in the 40s and he talked about if the nutrition the protein the sugars and the fats weren't in their absolute true form coming out of a beautiful healthy soil he said the the cells in our body would actually multiply but in rogue form so he was actually alluding to the mm. fact of how cancer was formed and and it's actually you know now being confirmed as you know in in modern science that it's actually the impact on the mitochondria and that you know uh, mm. cause cell health that's leading to a lot of these problems so um, yeah, it all goes back to the hmm. soil, and you know that's so, why I was at the conference. You know, drag it back to the soil. <laughs> yeah. Now, now there are two things as you know I, I would imagine are vital for a, a farmer, and that is water and and soil, and uh, and it would appear that they are intimately connected. Uh, why, why isn't this? Un- I mean, I know the perhaps the answer is a bit naive. I'm being a bit naive, but. I would imagine farmers should just embrace this with open arms. I mean, it gives them such independence. Or do they look at you and say, what do they say to you, Glenn? Well, I, th- I think, you know, we've, we've got a whole cultural, you know, background of, of just, as you said, you know, everyone's in a crippling drought at the moment and they're looking to the sky hmm. and they're thinking it's going to rain again and that'll save us. And the, the problem is we haven't made that sort of cultural connection that, that it, you know we're part of that sort of water cycle process, but but I think it is empowerment. You know, like if 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 we can get everyone, and I and I think that's what we need to get back to too. We we've got to stop the division between you know chemical farmers and organic farmers, or you know the city and the country. But we've all got to start to see that you know the farming um, sector and and the production of healthy food and and you know the the restoration of water cycling the you know the stabilization of the climate you know we're all in it together and and so the the farmers around me they they're still in that culture of you know just not getting that link and it, it's partly due to our training you know we we've we've got organizations and government bodies um that that don't have that culture of respect either and and that's really what we all need and it's really interesting looking at some other cultures like the Hawaiians that were deeply connected to the, the land and the air and the water and the Spanish in the Dehisa. They had this culture that's lasted thousands of years where they're deeply culturally connected. And, and it's not about the science. It's actually about having a culture where you actually respect that there's something greater, that the soil health is so amazing, the humus is so amazing, and, you know, and bring the science along with it. But we've actually got to start to say you know, we've got to start respecting the environment. And, you know, even our politics, as you're aware, Ron, you know, we've probably had a quarter of a century where, you know, let's focus on the economy, push the climate and, you know, natural resource base aside for a while and, and it'll be right. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it's up to us and, and we've got to get that culture. Um, and, and, and I think farmers will embrace this, but we, we've got to stop the division and, um, yeah, really look at, the whole picture. Do you do you as you move around the country or you talk to different farmers feel that farmers are are climate skeptics? You know, climate change skeptics. Or, or, or you know, what what what's your sense of how the how farmers view climate change? Yeah. Look. Um, yes, they are, and the. the 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 problem we've got there is, as I say, we've 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 had about a quarter of a century now of of politics sort of, you know, telling us that it's not a worry. And unfortunately, a lot of rural people are, you know, they they've got a background in conservative politics that they they believe what they're told. And 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 I I've been fighting hard um, against climate change now for for over twenty years, but. It, it's changing a little bit, and more and more people actually because of what's going on. Are actually starting to see that there is something in climate and you know and I'm actually proud to sort of be associated with farmers for climate action um, and they're getting a lot of members a lot of action but but generally um, the farmers are believing what they've been told and and we're in an electorate with a solid climate skeptic 
that's that been one of those people that have held things back, but he keeps getting voted in. So I think I think we've really got to start to question, you know, our leadership um, and on, on issues which are actually starting to impact us very badly. So at the moment we're in a, you know, nearly the worst, well, I think they're they're referring to it as the worst drought on record. And what really hit me the other day was driving through Tamworth, the sides of the mountains, the eucalypts are dying everywhere. So we're starting to see a, a water shortage and a, you know, extreme heat, um, you know, consequence of climate change occurring. And, and once we lose those forests, the water cycling will get even worse. So, so yeah, and and I put the responsibility squarely back on on the federal government because um, in 1988 Australia was leading the world in in climate change awareness and action, and we had politicians all over the country actually taking steps, and then the focus swung back around to you know this might be damaging to the economy, so we'll just put it aside. It you know mm. we'll ignore it for a bit, but. Now we, we can't ignore it for any longer. No. Um, now listen, your your farm is a cattle organic cattle farm. Yeah, that's correct. We we um, we've got two farms. I, I um, when I said we're on our second ten mm. year project, I I spent ten years on the Grafton property. It um, as I, as I mentioned when I got there, there was it was a very degraded resource base. Um, built it up and and then um, yeah moved over here for ten, but. What we do on the Grafton property is that's where we run our breeders. So it's a subtropical environment. So we run a Brahmin Hereford cross cow. Um, absolutely beautiful females. You know they're highly productive. They they convert that um, subtropical grass a lot better than British cattle. So you know beautiful females. And then we bring the progeny over to Inverell. And the reason we bought out west was we've got a really highly mineralised soil out here. You know it's got a massive um, cation exchange capacity with you know nutrient holding capacity and um, so so you get this flavor in the beef that's just absolutely amazing and and that's nutrition so so we we bring the progeny out here to finish them yeah hmm. now let, let's just talk about this Grafton property because you mentioned as a sort of a, an aside that it was a degraded property what does that actually mean I mean and how did you change it yeah thanks Ron um, yeah so so when I got there 20 years ago, it, it, it had been um, sort of neglected a little bit. I think the ownership was sort of in a process of changing and or succession changing, um, and the management had sort of, you know, been slipping, I guess, because they hadn't sort of gone out and employed someone that, you know, knew a lot about what they were doing. But anyway, I got there and it was basically the gates were open, um, it was set stock, the cattle were roaming everywhere, chewing everything in sight and, you know, the, the seasons had been a bit unfavourable but it was also overstocked. And so so very, very short grass. I think the mineral, it, it was a poor soil um, to start with because it's a yellow pod zolic. It's a naturally a poor soil. Um, but then the management, you know, just overgrazing, um, depleting all the organic matter of the soil. So that's that was a big thing. And and um, but also the minerals. So no mineralization, no organic matter, no fertility. Um, and and then, as I say, you'd, you'd sort of get this hard surface. You'd have no deep root systems to hold water or build humus. Um, and the water would literally, you know, you'd get six inches of rain over there and the water would just, you know, hit the surface and scream off. If any water did go in, <laughs> this is another form of erosion, I guess, of depleting nutrients, but the water would go straight through because it was a sandy soil. So it would go straight through the soil and take all the nutrients with it. So so you'd get leaching. Um, yeah, so so basically. And it, you know, it, was, a ca- it was a cattle or it was a, it was a f- cattle farm? It was. They'd yep. been sort of, um, you know, running a straight British herd there and the weaners were, you know, were really sort of performing badly. I guess the, the cattle were performing badly when I got there. And um, Now, you, yeah, mentioned, so we, you, um, you mentioned two things there that I think would be worth explaining a bit, and that was the set stocking and the overgrazing, because that's a big part of regenerating the land too, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. The management, as I say, it was just a bit relaxed and they, instead of sort of show, shutting gates and moving cattle around in a rotation, uh, they they had basically just let the cattle roam everywhere. But 
Um, so the first thing I, I did was basically start shutting gates and, and making sure that paddocks got a decent rest. And, um, yeah, so and, – and we reduced numbers of stock. But, um, yeah, as you mentioned, um, planned grazing or grazing management, uh, I mean, if you, if you graze badly, cattle are real – really bad for the environment, um, you know, and bad for water cycle and climate, everything else. And that's why they get a bad name. But if, but if you um, think carefully about how you're moving your stock, the stock become one of the greatest tools for actually rebuilding the organic matter in the soil, for actually restoring the humus, for restoring the water cycle, for restore, for sequestering carbon. So we have this amazing tool, I guess, of, of planned grazing and livestock for actually, you know, doing something real about climate change. And, and that's what, a, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people that hear negative stories about livestock don't actually get, that they're actually, if they're condemning livestock per se um, overall, then they're actually condemning one of the greatest tools we have of dealing with climate change. So so it's it's not the stock that's doing the damage. It's actually the people behind the stock. and. I often say a good grazing manager is like a great artist because when you do it really well, you can actually turn the whole situation around. So we've we've got massive amounts of organic matter now. We're sequestering carbon. We're restoring water cycles, and we've got amazing amounts of biodiversity coming back as well. We're planting trees. We're you know we're doing whatever we can to enhance a really you know restored landscape, which is um. It's a beautiful way to farm, yeah. Because that, cause that is something that I think, uh, you know, stereotypically we hear, look, and it's why a lot of people go to vegetarian or even vegan, um, you know, is, is because of the ethics and the climate, the implication the, of, of animal grazing. And this difference between overgrazing and, and planned grazing is huge because I think a lot of us have driven along the countryside and seen huge paddocks and seen cows or sheep scattered across that, that's that's kind of what you would describe as overgrazing, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things about building, you know, your soil health and your carbon is, is is you need to sort of have those plants really healthy as well. And, you know, probably about five days after a plant has been grazed off, it'll try and regrow again. So it'll, a grass will try and shoot again and, and, and if the stock are in that same paddock when the plant's trying to regrow, you're actually starting to weaken the root system. So the roots are actually shedding and getting smaller. And, and then you end up with a sort of very shallow root system, which doesn't build the deep levels of humus and sequester the carbon. You're actually burn, starting to burn your carbon out of your landscape. Um, and that's when, you know, you're actually contributing to a degrading landscape. So it, it's quite hard for extensive farms in Australia to um, to get into a really um, fine tuned plan grazing method, but but there is massive areas um, being done at the moment in Australia, and it's it's the way to go. Yeah. So so you have uh, restored this Grafton property. You know you've worked on it for ten years, and now you're in Inverell. As you as you go through that countryside, and we're in the worst drought that there ever has been. Does is it is it visibly different your property to your neighbour's property? Yeah, look, <laughs> it, 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 it it's continuing to surprise me through this drought, Ron. And it's you know we took measures early in the drought. We um we looked at our numbers back in autumn, um late autumn when our wieners normally come from the Grafton property to the Inverell property, and we said um, there's no point running the full numbers because we'll end up at the end of winter having to sell them when the markets are back. And so we, we reduced our numbers by a third to start with. Um, but even with the number of cattle that we did carry through, and a lot of people have had to totally destock, and and some areas are a lot harder than we are as well. But but the work that we've done over the last 10 years, and, and people sort of asked me during this drought, you know, what are you doing about the drought? But, but it's not actually what we've done so much in the drought it's actually 10 years of of really painstaking management to try and get the soil health up and you know splitting the paddocks up uh, putting the water points in you know doing some mineralization you know and and getting that humus up and and the hardest thing about focusing on soil humus and organic matter you know and people will say it and it's a throwaway term but you know building humus they say organic matter soils or dirt or whatever you want to call it 
It's not sexy. And, <laughs> you know, and, and the thing is I can't run into town and buy a truckload of humus and, and, and feel really proud and come home and drive my tractor around spreading humus because that's not how it works. What you've actually got to do is, 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 is actually just use the methods of planned grazing and put your cattle in and give it a good rest. But, but keep the machinery and the chemicals away from it because we've got to start looking after that microbial workforce and it's back to your human microbiome. It's, it's respecting the microbes, you know, it's, it's leaving them alone, you know, stopping the compaction, stopping the chemical input and, and so, so the property is really going well and the Grafton property just went through two years of really tough time before this drought even set in and, and they're, we're running at full numbers down there at a cow per hectare, basically, huh. um, and the cows are shiny and fat and, you know, the, the yeah. So, so do, do your neighbours who, uh, who've gone through ag school uh, and who keep telling you you don't know what you're talking about, how, I just, you know, how could that escape them that something different is going on and that something different is positive? Uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I guess, am I being naive here? Is this just uh, me being silly? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. And, and the other thing about our area, like at Inverell, um, you know, we've got a lot of people that are cropping around us, sort of, you know, around the area. So mm. they, they're not looking at what we're doing because we're a grazier and they're a cropper. So, um, but, but they, they should be sort of starting to think about organic matter in cropping as well. And, you know, the nutritional quality of the food they're producing and water cycling, they, all, all those factors apply. But, um, down at Grafton, we've got a lot of grazers around us. What we've, what I'm finding, Ron, has been, you know, during this drought particularly, but, there's little networks popping up everywhere. So they might not be right on your doorstep because sometimes it takes a bit more for a neighbour to sort of change, you know, looking, you know, very proud people on the land. And, hmm. and, and so what you'll get is a little, you'll get someone doing it a little way away and, you know, creating a hub and, and then a different area will sort of get going. But um, hmm. the, the grazing management is certainly getting looked at favourably nowadays, I think, for building landscapes, yeah. I mean, uh, what are some of the challenges that farmers are facing? I mean, obviously climate is one of them. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough life out there on the farm, I, but, but people obviously like yourself are very passionate about it. What are some of the challenges that you see, you know, that, that we may not be aware of in, in the city for a farmer? Yeah. Look, I think that, yeah, by far the greatest challenge at the moment is, is weather-related or climate-related. Um, I think, you know, this podcast is probably a good opportunity to say to people in the city, you know, it, it, you know, the climate is changing rapidly and, you know, the cities are very isolated from it. And that, that's quite often the hardest thing that I, <laughs> that I have to deal with is, is going to the coast and finding out no one's even aware that you're dry. Mm -hmm. um, no one's even aware that, you know, the climate is rapidly changing and, and, and they might hear bits about it. They might even say they believe in it, but, but sometimes the lifestyle in the city, you know, and, and, and Australia has led a really luxurious lifestyle because our governments have sort of said we didn't need to worry about climate change. And, and I, think, I think we need to sort of see that everyone's taking steps and, and, you know, our actions, you know, the type of food we're buying, the type of cars we're driving, type of houses we're living in, you know, we're, we're all sort of contributing to this warming climate, which is really starting to affect food supplies. I think this year is one of the first years on record that a lot of really good farming areas haven't been able to grow a crop. So, um, yeah, by, by, you know, consumers in the cities sort of watching where their food's coming from, knowing that they're not just buying food. It's, it's a bit like my journey. It's, you know, I'm not just a farmer growing food. I'm actually a farmer that's actually connected to trying to restore a water cycle and a, you know, healthy climate. And I think, um, consumers in the city, you know, can really help farmers by, by doing that. And one, one of the things that sort of came up yesterday, Ron, was, you know, looking at Malcolm Turnbull's electorate and they, you know, this is a blue ribbon liberal seat, but, but, if if we've got climate skeptics in the National Party or the Liberal Party, you know, is it okay to keep putting those politicians um, in control of what's going on with our country? And and I think you know we've had enough of ignoring climate change. 
And and that was the third time when Malcolm Turnbull lost his position the other day. That was the third time that I've seen a leader rolled with some form of weakened policy on climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, so are we going to keep voting for this type of politics and watching our country dry up and blow away? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no. Look, I look. Uh, I know it's just something that uh, some of my listeners have a little bit of trouble coming to terms with but the connection. No, well, the connection between politics and health and politics and food and politics and farming, you, you can't, it's, it's, it's just interconnected. Uh, that's what holistic is actually all about. What do you think we, I mean, yes, being more aware of it, what else can we in the city do to help that, you know, make the farmer's life a better one? I think because um, I... You know, I'm I'm seeing the sort of you know farmers going along, really struggling through this drought, and and you know, and as I say, they've a lot of the times they've done no more than to follow the conventional wisdom, if you like, the conventional training and and you know the advice that we're getting from from governments and from agricultural organisations, and I I think it it really you know, it needs to be a culture of change right through. So so we need to, you know, people in the city can help influence that, you know, um, state governments, for instance, actually have strong policies in climate and water and, you know, actually, you know, back natural resource management health and, and connect the food to it. It's It's such a beautiful vision for the future that we've got if we start restoring... Um, the landscape and, and start supporting farmers to actually, you know, enhance their landscapes by by price signals, by what you buy. Um, yeah, and and that and the future is bright in that direction. But if we keep ignoring it, if we keep sort of allowing our, you know, state governments or whatever to to make bad policy decisions, um, yeah, we're going to continue to see the downward slide. Yeah. Now, listen, Glenn. Just finally, I just uh, taking a step back from your role as a as an organic farmer. Um, what do you think the greatest challenge is for people on their health journey in our modern world through their lives? I mean, you know, we're all on this journey together. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people? I think the greatest challenge for people, you know, is to actually um, on their health journey is actually you know to 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 identify that. Their, their food is their health. So they've, they've, they've got to identify that nutrition coming from a really healthy soil is paramount. So, so identifying where they find that food and, and making sure that, that they stick to that because, you know, there's so much, um, I suppose, inferior or, you know, chemically contaminated food or, um, or just even the wrong wrong types of diet out there. Um, I think it's just really important that people um, find healthy, um, clean, nutritious food, um, and and by doing that, they're, they're making sure that you know their their landscape is healthy as um, you know climate and and water cycle and all that's functioning as well. Um, but but. But making you know making sure they they know the farm behind that food you know hmm. and 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 empowering that farmer to keep doing what he's doing and that'll that'll just send signals through the whole ag sector that you know the customers are really aware of their body health and and they they're going to support us to actually grow that food we we want to produce that food we you know we want the signal to say you know we don't want to just produce quantity. We want to produce quality, and and I think you know that, that really needs to come in a hurry. Glenn, what a great message to finish with! Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, John. There are some recurring themes in this podcast, which apply to our own individual health and clearly the health of our soils and ultimately our planet. Now, if you go back and listen to our podcast with Alan Savory, he said it's not a particular resource which is the problem, say fossil fuel or animal agriculture, it's the way that resource is managed. Alan introduced the term holistic context, which he described as the overriding principle which guides all subsequent decisions. He also mentioned 
that soil erosion is a huge problem. And now, according to the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, 75 billion tonnes of soil. Now, that's the equivalent of nearly 10 million hectares of arable land is lost to erosion, waterlogging and salination every year. And another 20 million hectares is abandoned because its soil quality has been degraded. On another podcast we did with Charles Massey, a fifth generation farmer who did his PhD on sustainable agriculture and wrote that beautiful book, The Call of the Reed Warbler, he outlined five key cycles for agriculture to be sustainable. The solar cycle. Now, Glenn also referred to perennial vegetation, delivering organic material and nutrients to the soil via vegetation and photosynthesis. Remember that from high school? The water cycle. Having organic matter in the soil helps retain water rather than erode it. The soil mineral cycle. This is when microbes taking take the plant sugars and enrich the soil with minerals. And it's those minerals we all need to be healthy. The fourth was a dynamic eco-cycle. And this is really interesting, the importance of biodiversity in building resilience. Interestingly, the more diverse the gut microbiome is, the healthier you are. And so it would seem with our soils as well. And the last cycle, the final one, was the human social cycle, which includes you and me and is precisely why I include this in my podcast, this topic of farming and sustainability, and why I believe we in the city need to engage with these issues. Glenn described his beautiful vision of the future. And and actually, in my book, I wrote that in the last half of the 20th century, it was an era of the revered financier or tech guru, and I hope the coming century will be the era of the revered farmer. They grow the nutrient-dense food we need to be healthy they, nu- nu- <laughs> they nurture the soils for now and for future generations. So just as in healthcare, and so it would seem in agriculture and farming, you can follow the messages of corporations who gain, whose main goal is to sell product and make profit, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that, except when it affects our health and the health of our planet. They are inseparable. That is the holistic context. Look, we get to vote every three or four years, and one might argue about the difference that makes, but we do get to vote each and every day with the things we choose to spend our money on and the decisions we make. And if money talks, and it clearly does, then give your money a voice that shares that beautiful vision Glenn spoke of. So until next week, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner.